Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11 is where we're going this morning. And the entire sermon is going to be about you and me being ready. And so after that, we minister this morning and we get into God's Word. We see what God's Word has to say. And you leave here today knowing that you need to be ready, knowing that you should be ready, and knowing that you may need to be ready uh, sometime throughout this week, okay? Okay. Hope that you were able to keep your building block with you throughout the week. You don't have to give that back now. I put up the box. We'll continue to use that uh, throughout the years, over the years. Or if a kid wants to take the remaining Legos home, they can do that too. We'll buy new uh, when that time comes around again. But you can keep your block with you. Put it on your nightstand, your desk at work, your car, dashboard, wherever, so that it is a continual reminder, as the Lord said for us last week, that we ought to be a building block and not a what? Stumbling block, all right? So Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11, we know this chapter is one of the chapters that contains, along with Revelation chapter 2, uh, chapter 2 and chapter 3 uh, of the book of Revelation is a um, basically a collective amount of letters that were written, so to speak, to each of the churches and uh, God speaking to them. And Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11, we're going to the church at Philadelphia. It's a familiar word to us, all right, brotherly love. And so this is what uh, that God spoke uh, to this church in particular in Revelation chapter 3 and said, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11, Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Okay, now you stay right there, and I want you also uh, to look in your outline because I'm going to give you several verses this morning about the coming of the Lord, about how we're told in God's Word that the Lord comes quickly. We're going to even talk about something that's called in the twinkling of an eye that the Lord uh, is going to come, all right? So we all know, we've heard over the years about the Lord coming back. Is that really a thing is is Christ really going to come back? How does this thing uh, happen? It, that the Lord is going to come back on clouds and get all of His people and somehow put us on that cloud and take us back to a place called heaven, up to a place called heaven? Are we going to really be there forever? And will we sing that we're going to be there forever? Uh, Amazing Grace is a song that we probably all know at least some of it by heart. And it says in one of the verses, when we've been there 10,000 years, we will have no less days to sing God's praise. In other words, we'll have 10,000 more. And when we get to the end of the 10,000 and then the 10,000, we'll have no less days to sing God's praise. Why does it say that? Is that Truthful, yes, it is of truth that we are going to be in heaven forever. There will be no end. That's why we call it eternal. One of these days, you are going to be in eternal life. One of these days, I am going to be in eternal life. And it's hard for us to get a grasp on just what the word eternal means because nothing in this life is forever. Oh, they say diamonds are, but they are not. And any man who has ever bought one diamond knows that two is better or three is better. And you can buy one, but you'll have to buy another uh, when that one gets old. So diamonds don't last forever. Nothing lasts forever. The clothes that you have on will not last forever. The shoes that you have on will not last forever. The car that you drove to church this morning will certainly not last forever. More importantly, the life that you are living today will not last forever. It's already been told to us this morning of the passing of people here locally. It happens every day. And it should be eye-opening to us and a continual reminder that the life that we live, however blessed that it is and joyful that it is, and we love the people that we're surrounded by, and we love the things that God has blessed us with, and the things that we do, overall, God has given us all a good life. But it's not going to be forever. 
but eternal life will be. And so how does this thing, how is it all going to happen? Well, let's talk about this. The Bible says in Revelation 3 and 11, Jesus once again emphasizes how that he comes quickly. He said, Behold, I, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. And if you look at the seven churches of Asia, you'll find that where Philadelphia appeared to be of the better. There was not, nothing negative that God said about this church. You can read starting in verse 7 and go all the way down through verse 11. And I did that this morning. And you will not find any negative that God said about them. Now the other churches you'll find uh, were that God spoke some negative and said you need to get this corrected. And he would say, I know thy works. To the church at Laodicea, he said what? You are lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. And he would go on to say certain things about one church, how they had allowed Satan to creep in. And he admonished that. And he recognized that. But in the church of Philadelphia, there was not much negative to say. But yet there was still a warning that the Lord was going to come quickly and that upon doing so, the people needed to be ready so that no one would be able to come in and deceive them and to tempt them and just take away the crown. Now, what does it mean to be ready? And why do we need to be ready? Well, I just looked up yesterday. I thought, well, I know what it means to be ready. But sometimes when we go to define something, when your kid says, Dad, what does it mean to be ready? Well, it means to be ready. Well, what's that mean? It means to be ready. But I love this definition that Webster actually gives to us. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it says, to be ready is to be in a suitable state for a situation. Well, what is the situation we're going to talk about this morning? It's the coming of the Lord. I want you to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Do I need to get ready today? The Bible says you do. Why do we need to get ready today? Because the Lord could come back today. Why do I need to be ready? Because He's coming after those that are watching. He's coming after those that are ready. Well, what does it mean to be ready? It means to be in a suitable state for a situation. So the situation is the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you here in just a second how He's going to do that. Well, how quick is it going to happen? Do I have time to get ready once it starts? Nope. The Bible doesn't say that. Why not? Because look how quick that it's going to happen. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 27, Jesus speaking these words said, As the lightning cometh from the east and shines into the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Just like that. The Lord is coming. Do you know in the time frame that we've been here for 40 minutes, we started at 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock worship, in the 40 minutes that we've been here, how many times that the Lord could have came back and grabbed His children and took us home to be with Him? Do you know how many times that could have happened? Well, I'll tell you how many times that it could have happened. If you look up how quick that it takes you to blink your eye, how many times that you've done that, even unknowingly, in the last 40 minutes is how many times that Christ could have already come back in the twinkling of an eye. And I always hate to mention in the twinkling of an eye because now everybody's going to start noticing when they blink. And for the next 30 seconds, every time you blink, you're going to notice it. But can you imagine that every opportunity that you've had to blink over the last 40 minutes is how many times that Christ could have came back and gathered up His church. And so we say, then, now we go back and say, are you ready? Am I ready for what? Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Behold, I come quickly. Jesus is coming. After he died, was resurrected by the power of God, he went into heaven. And the Bible says that there was two men, two disciples that were standing there, and they were sort of dumbfounded, as any of us would be. They were standing there. Jesus all of a sudden, poof. He ascends back into heaven. And the angel spoke to these men and said, Why stand ye gazing? 
Why are you dumbfounded over what just happened? And he goes on to say, the angel said, for this same manner that Christ went away, he's going to come again. It's a promise to us that Christ is going to come back. That Jesus or this Jesus, this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. He's coming and he's coming quickly. Now my papa told us for years as he was the Sunday school superintendent at our church in the time that I was growing up and he would always stand and teach the adult Sunday school lesson every Sunday morning. He done a wonderful job doing that. I watched him study throughout the week, read the word of God and he would stand and diligently and faithfully teach the Sunday school lesson every Sunday morning and as we would all come back in from our classes and, and, and we were getting ready to go into the worship service he would always say, and I remind you, the Lord is soon coming. The Lord is soon coming. And what pride that I have to be able to stand and say the same thing this morning. Years, he's been dead. He's been laying in the ground for some time now. And I'm still able of his blood to carry on that tradition of saying the Lord is soon coming. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 22, the Bible says, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and he described a time that is unlike anything you and I have ever seen. Paul said, In the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, the trump of God shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise, and those of us which are alive and remain shall, shall call, be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, what does that mean for us? You say, Joe, that sounds like something I'd watch on Netflix. Oh, my friend, Netflix can't give a portrayal of what this event is. I mean, I watch all kinds of documentaries. I, I love watching the, the, the history of, of, of certain things. And I, I'll get on there and I'll go to the documentaries and I'll find something, whether it be uh, the cheating scandal in the NBA or a murder mystery that no one has ever solved or uh, some fraudulent scheme of a businessman. And I'll watch that. Why? I'm intrigued by that because I know it's something that actually happened. I, I'm not a big sci-fi guy. I, I'm not a big uh, fiction guy. If it's not real, I'm not into it. And, and I know some of you are, and that's fine. I don't have any problems with it. It's just not my thing. I like real. And so I watch those documentaries. And maybe one day there will be a documentary that will try to explain what just happened. What is going to happen? There is going to be a day, maybe just like that we're in, right here in a setting much like we're in this morning, where that all of a sudden we're going to hear a sound like we've never heard before. And before you have the opportunity to turn around and see what is happening, all of a sudden Christians all over the world are gone. I mean, we're leaving. We are leaving and thank God for it. And if it happened today, I'd be just fine with it. And you say, whoa, I'm not quite there yet. Well, then you need to get ready. That's the whole definition of ready. If I'm ministering to you and God is speaking to us about the coming of the Lord and you're getting nervous and you say, I don't know about that. I hope it don't happen today. Then it could be that you are not in a ready state what does ready mean it means to be in a suitable state for any for a certain situation are you ready we're coming up on baseball i have my first little league baseball practice tonight at eight o'clock <laughs> how much do you think i'm going to get out of nine ten eleven and twelve year olds tonight at eight o'clock and snow on the ground probably not very much well, maybe one of the, and maybe when it thaws out and we're actually able to play a game and a kid gets up to bat and you can tell the kids that are ready to get in there and swing and the kids that are not ready to get in there at all. And the coach will say, as the ball comes and the pitch is thrown and they just stand there and they look and they watch it pass. Strike one. And you ask that kid, are you ready? 
Ready for what? Are you ready for the ball to come? Because you didn't look ready at all. Here comes the next pitch. And the kid stands there and he's froze and he looks. Strike two. And now the coach has lost his mind. He's throwing his hat. He's calling timeout. And he walks up to the kid and he says, Are you ready? Are you ready to swing? You don't look ready to swing. And most of the time it don't work. And the pitch is thrown and they watch strike three and they're out and they go back to the concession stand and get a hot dog and sit in the dugout. <laughs> and so I had a kid one time, there's a mandatory play in Little League. Every kid has to play two innings in the field and they have to bat one time. And I had a kid one time, he started the game. But he knew he wasn't going to be in more than two innings. And as soon as he went out into the outfield, I heard him screaming at his mom. And he said, Mom, after the second inning, get me a hot dog. <laughs> he knew he was coming out of the game. He was ready to come out. But are you ready for the coming of the Lord? The Lord shall come. It's going to happen. You say, well, it's not happened all of these years. That, make us, that should make us want to get more ready today. Knowing that we truly are living in the last hour, that the Lord could come and He could come today. And we ought to be preparing our hearts as if He were. And that's what the whole purpose of Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11 was. When Christ was speaking to the church, He said, I come quickly. You need to be in a situation where you are not giving anybody the ability to tempt you or to tarnish you or to pull you away from the love and the faith that you have for me because I come quickly. Once the sound of the trumpet is blown, it's not then time to run to the church and see the pastor and say, I need to get saved. I should have done it a long time ago. I need to do it now. My friend, if you've got a pastor who's worth a grain of salt, he's going to be on the cloud on his way to heaven. And, and by the way, if you come to church, if you hear the trump of God sound, the dead in Christ rise and the church gone up to be gathered together in the air and the meeting in the air, we sing about that. And you come to Willow Fern Church and I'm sitting here, <laughs> then we're in this mess together. <laughs> and so, you know, we just got, we're in it together. Neither one of us were ready. And that's going to happen. Those that think they're ready are not going to be ready. And that, that is going to happen. That there's going to be some that's got, that's got a cross on their arm, but they don't have a cross on their heart. You know what I mean? They have a cross on their neck, but they don't have a cross on their heart. They've got Jesus on their lips, but they don't have Jesus on their heart. And Jesus is going to one day say to them, Depart from me, I, I never knew you. What do you mean? I had your name tattooed on my arm. But Christ is going to say, But you don't have it on your heart. But I wore a cross around my neck. But you didn't wear it around your heart. Amen? Romans chapter 2 and verse 7 to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. That, that's my main purpose in this life is to get ready for the life to come. And in doing so, I want to, and I want you to be a part of this, that we are to be the light as a city that sets upon a hill that cannot be hid, the salt of the earth. We ought to be going out, and we ought to be sounding the alarm that Christ is coming, Christ is coming, Christ is coming. And you say, well, we'll, we'll be like the boy who cried wolf, who came down into the community and said, a wolf, a wolf. No wolf ever came. So the people stopped believing. And I believe that maybe in today's society, maybe that's what's happened. That we've read in God's Word for so long that Christ is coming, Christ is coming, and we preached about it, and we sang about it, and, and we've been instructed about it, and yet we look up, and there is no sound, there is no Christ, there is no cloud, there is no ascension of the dead. There, none of these things have happened. And so we quit believing. And in our stopping to believe, we fail to get ready. 
And do you know that Jesus said, I'm going to come as a thief? A thief in the night. I was talking to one of my neighbors just yesterday. We were outside and I was doing a little work and he was too. And he was walking his dogs and I was doing a little work and we stopped to chat a little bit and he said, I, I think we had a lot of ruckus in the neighborhood last night. I said, is that right? He said, I, I think one neighbor was fighting with another neighbor. He's my neighbor watch. I don't have to, I don't, he tells me everything. And I was all ears. I said, well, tell me all about it. And he began to tell, I said, what time did this all happen? He said, I think it was around two in the morning. Well, there's a reason that I didn't hear it. And my friend, I, I didn't hear anything at two in the morning. And I'm telling you right now that the thief probably could have come into my house at two in the morning the same time my neighbors were fighting. And apparently it woke up all the neighborhood but me. And a thief could have come in and stole everything that I had unbeknownst to me. I wasn't ready for the thief to come. But my friend, I want to be ready when the Lord comes. I want to be ready when the Lord comes. Matthew chapter 25 is a story that we spend the last part of our 10 minutes this morning in. The Bible says, matter of fact, I would encourage you to go read Matthew chapter 25 this morning because it talks about us needing to be ready, be ready, be ready, be ready, be ready. And it just, be ready, be ready, be re Read Matthew 25 and what you should get out of Matthew 25 is that I need to be ready. Be ready for what? Come on, don't be a dummy. Be ready for the coming of the Lord. What does be ready mean? It means to be in a suitable state for a situation. What's the situation? The Lord's coming. And you need to be in a suitable state to be ready for that. Matthew 25, then shall the kingdom of heaven be like ten virgins. Five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. The Bible says that the reason that those that were foolish were foolish is because they took their lamps, but they had no oil. And the reasoning behind the wise was that they took the oil in their vessels with their lamps. It's an easy description. What use is a lamp without oil? Only a fool would carry a lamp without oil. The whole purpose of the lamp is to give light in the darkness. And without, uh, without oil, you can have no light. Therefore, you have no need to pack a lamp. It's like carrying a gun with no bullets. You're Barney Fife. <laughs> You're of no good. The gun is useless. And so is the lamp without oil. It, it has no way of producing any light. And so the foolish, they were packing around their lamps, but they had no oil. But the wise, the Bible says, they took oil in their vessels with their lamps, and while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was made. It said, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. Oh, Jesus wonderfully describes many times that we are His bride. And as the bridegroom, He is coming back for His bride. He is coming back for the church. And there is going to be those that are ready versus those that are not ready. We have that in the church this morning, right now, here at Willowfern. I love you, everyone. I would do anything for you, and I mean anything for you. I love you that much. But I'm telling you that some are ready and some are not. And those that are not ready need to get ready. When do I need to get ready? You need to get ready today. Now you don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you the truth. You didn't come to a church where I tell you that everything's going to be all right. You're going to do whatever you want to. And, and I'm not going to give you cotton candy. If I give you cotton candy every Sunday, you're going to get sick to your stomach and you're going to regurgitate it. Amen? Let me give you a little meat of God's Word and you can gnaw on it and it'll be, it'll be health to your bones and you can grow thereby. And when Christ comes, we can be a church that's ready to go. I believe there's going to be churches all over America that's going to be stunned one day 
when the trump of God sounds, the dead in Christ rise, and their whole church gathers on Sunday to worship the Lord. Why is that going to happen? How is that going to happen? Because, my friend, I was thinking yesterday, when we come into our church, we don't turn the lights down. We don't have smoke shows, light shows. We, we don't have players, and, and we don't have characters, and, and we don't shoot T-shirts out of cannons, and, and, and we don't have drawings and giveaways, and, 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 and this is not a theatrical performance. All the lights are on in God's house. I can see every one of you. It's not a movie theater. We don't have electric guitars, and, and we don't have uh, ten drum sets, and, and we don't have, not to say there's anything wrong with drum sets or electric guitars, but we're not playing music that you can't barely tell the difference of whether it's ACDC or Ryan and the Boys. That's the, that's the best I could come up with. <laughs> I mean, when we sing, you know it's church, amen? amen? And it ought to be that way. Why? Because I want our church to be a church that's ready for the coming of the Lord. And, and, be, and, and woe unto me. Woe unto me and nobody else, but woe unto me. If God was to send His Son to gather up the church today, and our church is not part of it. Amen? The Bible says the bridegroom comes and it's ready for them to go out and meet them. The virgins arose, they trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise said, Not so, there's not enough. See, on my way up, I can't grab you. And on your way up, you can't grab me. That's not how it works. It's not that, that, that God's going to come and, and I'm going to be in the house and I get to go and just because I get to go, everybody in my house gets to go with me. No, it's, this is not a VIP. Just because you get to go doesn't mean everybody gets to go with you. You've got to make your own calling and election sure. You've got to be right with Christ. I've got to be right with Christ. A husband has to be right with Christ, and so does the wife have to be right with Christ. And just because the husband is doesn't mean the wife is, and just because the wife is doesn't mean the husband is. Amen? You say, I didn't come for this this morning. Yeah, but you get it anyway. <laughs> I've said it many times. Nobody's going to leave. You just got to endure it. We got three minutes left. And I've got a story to tell. The Bible says, While they went to buy oil, the bridegroom came. And they were ready, went in with him to the marriage. And I want you to look what Matthew chapter 25 and verse 10 says. This is the most important part of the whole sermon this morning is that when in Matthew chapter 25, verse 10, the wise virgins went out to meet the bridegroom, they went to where the bridegroom was, and the Bible says the door was shut. The door was shut. I want you to turn over to Genesis 7, 16 sometime today. Write it down. You don't have to turn over there now. It'll take you too long to find it. I'll be done by the time you get there. But in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 16, the Bible says this, that Noah, how many people went into the ark? Eight people. Noah, his wife, his sons, Sham, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. There was eight people that were saved by Almighty God. When the flood came and destroyed every living creature, the Bible says there was eight people that were saved. How were they saved? God said to Noah, build an ark. Build an ark, that's what he did. He brought the animals in two by two as was instructed by God and then he brought his family in, all eight of them. There they were, packed into the ark and the Bible says right before that the rains came and the floods uh, descended and, and the waters rose. Do you know what happened that day? See, it wasn't that Noah needed to put a rope on that door so that when he went in, he could pull that door up. No. There didn't even need to be a latch on that door because when God shut it, it was shut. 
When God shuts the door, my friends, the door is shut. And it doesn't matter how much political power you've got. It doesn't matter how much money you've got. It doesn't matter how much influence you've got, how much education you've got. It does not matter. When God slams the door, the door will not be open. The Bible says the door was shut. And here come those foolish virgins. And they knocked. But they couldn't get in. Because the Lord said unto them, I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. And then he goes on to say, Jesus said, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. You don't know. You just got to be ready when he does. Here's my story, and I am with this. Yesterday, we went to Hibbets, the sporting goods store. Peyton had the worst experience of his life. As we pulled in, we didn't really go for really much purpose. It was just me, him, and Preston, or me, him, and Parker. Preston was at that academic thing. Cassie went with him, and the dumb part of our family stayed at home. And so we went to the sporting goods store. And as we pulled in, Peyton said, I need some shoes. I said, what kind of shoes do you need? I just need shoes. And I said, well, we'll see what we can find. Daddy's not much on buying shoes because I don't like to spend that kind of money. And so we went in and there was this vast selection of shoes. And he said, he said, I think I wear about a one, one and a half. Here come this guy up. Can I help you all? And I hadn't even got to the shoes yet, but he come up to me and he said, Dad, I found a pair of shoes. He said, bad part. He said, they're $110. I said, all right, well, let's, let's go up here and see what we can do. Well, God was in it because we handed that guy a shoe that was about this long that cost $110 that Nike probably made for $1.50. And, and the guy said, I'll be right back. He comes back. He said, I don't have that size. Whew, thank you, God. And, and I said, well, buddy, I said, he said, I don't really like any of the rest of them. Thank you, God. And I said, well, let's go look at something else. So anyway, we went around and we looked and he couldn't find anything. And that wasn't even the bad part of his day. We got out into the parking lot and Parker was there being the obnoxious 13 year old that he is. And he runs over, I got a shotgun and he gets in the, passenger seat and I get in the driver's seat well I didn't know it but Pre Peyton had tried to get in too and Parker said no that's not how this works I said shotgun you get in the back I didn't hear any of that I thought Peyton had already got in the back and so as he was making his way around the back of the truck I put it in drive and he was pulling out and I heard I heard something clicking, like click, 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 click. And I thought it was Peyton in the back trying to get on his seatbelt. But what he was doing is he was on the outside pulling on the door trying to get in. And so I stopped and I thought, oh God, I've killed, I've killed Peyton and Cassie's not even here. And... And so I threw it up in the park and I opened the door and there he was standing there and his eyes were that big around and he said, were you just going to leave me? <laughs> and, and then of course being the dad, I said, get in the car, you know, and, and he, he could not get over it. And the whole way home, we would be talking about something else and he would just insert were you just going to leave me in the parking lot? And I said, I'm telling you, I thought you were in the truck. I thought you were ready to go. And he wasn't. And he was just outside pulling on that door handle. And we was pulling off. I'm telling you, my friend, I've been waiting all morning to get to that story. That's going to, that's going to be the way that it is. 
The Lord is going to come back and there are going to be some that are going to be pulling at the door, begging, let me in, let me in, don't forget me, don't leave me. And off we go. And I know, and some of you who are biblical scholars may come up to me afterwards and say, well, there's going to be a time frame and the tribulation. I, I know all that, my friend. I get all that. I know there are going to be conversions during that. I get all that. But I'm telling you, my friend, if you're banking on that, that's the wrong place to place your risk. Why don't you get ready today? It's a lot easier to get ready now and be ready for the coming of the Lord than it is to stake your claim that you'll get ready after that time frame. Amen? Amen. Stand with us all over God's